On Valentine's Day, President Joe Biden announced through an executive order that he would be bringing back the one thing everyone has been clamoring for, the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. Yay? <laughs> is that a good thing? Kind of sounds like a bad thing. So which is it? Well, let's talk about what this office is. Biden is continuing a program started by George W. Bush meant to connect the government with predominantly faith-based groups and, among other things, give them taxpayer money to provide social services. Maybe churches are running homeless shelters or food pantries, and they could use the money to do work that helps communities. Don't we want to support organizations like that even if they're religious? They're doing a good thing, right? Maybe. More on that in a second. Now, the office itself sounds problematic if you're an atheist, but it really depends on who's in charge of it. In its very short history, it's been everything from a gift to conservative Christians to an actually useful way to connect with religious groups doing secular work. Look, a lot of Americans are motivated by their faith and they're connected to their communities through a church or synagogue or mosque. And it is important to have connections with those people, even if that means going through their religious leaders. There's nothing illegal about that, but only under a few conditions. The office should make sure it isn't promoting a particular religion. It has to make sure to include members of minority faiths, it needs to recognize that people without any religious faith also share many of the same concerns and may be in a position to provide social services as well. We should not be left out of the conversation. Under President Bush, this was a major problem. If you asked atheist activists two decades ago what they were most concerned about, this was right up there on the list, this idea that the government would be giving money to religious groups to essentially spread their faith under the guise of helping people. I had hoped that President Obama would just get rid of the office. He kept it. But he also reformed it. In his first term, he appointed a young guy named Joshua Dubois, who was a Pentecostal minister, to run that office. It changed mostly for the better, but one big issue Dubois didn't really address was that some groups receiving taxpayer money said they could never hire, for example, people in same-sex relationships. It's one thing for your church to say that about its staff, but why are taxpayers footing the bill for a group that discriminates regardless of what they're doing with the money? Still, being religious shouldn't give you a free pass on that sort of thing when it involves federal funding. If you're a Catholic adoption agency that doesn't want to work with same-sex parents, that's your stupid decision, but you shouldn't get taxpayer funding for that. But it's also very controversial to say all that, because it means you're basically making life harder for groups trying to do something useful. Those Catholic adoption agencies do a lot of good. Really, they do. But they are bigots. Should the government refuse to give those groups money because they're bigots? Or should the government give them funding because they're doing good work despite their bigotry? Conservatives would argue it's religious discrimination to say we're not going to give you funding just because you have sincerely held beliefs we don't like. It's not like you're using the money to promote those beliefs, after all. These groups just have some guidelines that have everything to do with practicing their faith. But that's a big reason why, under Obama, this office was still controversial for many liberals, like me, who wished he would just get rid of it. Here's another reason it was unpopular. Obama had a couple of advisory councils to help deal with these issues. You know, bring together a diverse array of experts and leaders and let them hash out some of the more contentious issues. Good idea. But there wasn't a single non-religious representative on those councils. There were church-state separation advocates, yes, but no open atheists. 
if you want input from people of different religious beliefs, it seemed like a missed opportunity to not hear from the people representing the fastest growing religious demographic in the country. Why didn't you call me, Barack? One of those good guys on those councils, though, was the head of Americans United for Separation of Church and State, Reverend Barry Lynn, who later said about Dubois that his tenure was a lost opportunity to fix real constitutional problems, such as government financing of religious organizations that discriminate in hiring or that serve the public in overtly religious settings. But guess what? In 2013, Obama's second term, Dubois resigned, and Obama replaced him with a woman named Melissa Rogers. Rogers was the former general counsel for the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty. And if you know nothing else about that group, just know that they are the good Baptists. They are very much not the anti-gay, anti-women, super racist Southern Baptists. So Melissa Rogers was tapped to run the place, and she generally got rave reviews from our side of the aisle. That's because pretty much everyone who worked with her knew she absolutely respected the First Amendment's Establishment Clause. She was a defender of the wall of separation between church and state. The only time building a wall and the federal government sound really good together. In fact, her appointment was met with gushing praise from the leaders of several church-state separation groups, including Americans United, the ACLU, Interfaith Alliance, the American Humanist Association, and the Center for Inquiry. It wasn't just talk. During Rogers' time working for Obama, the office literally met with the Secular Coalition for America, the lobbying group for atheists in Washington, D.C., Sorry for the quality of the picture, but that's Rogers in the middle meeting with the SCA. Atheists also pushed for a policy preventing groups receiving grants from basically preaching while using taxpayer funds. So we had a voice there. So while the office itself was at the center of a lot of criticism from the atheist community, Rogers was certainly more inclusive of us than anyone before her, and the office did what it could to prevent religious proselytization at taxpayers' expense. Of all the Obama-era kerfuffles, this office under Rogers was like Obama wearing a tan suit. It wasn't really controversial as far as controversies go. Now here's a pop quiz for you. Who ran that office under Donald Trump? The answer, maybe surprisingly, is no one. His administration pretty much just ignored the office. They never had anyone lead it up. Instead, Trump started a much different White House Faith and Opportunity Initiative, which was really more of a club for conservative Christians. Let's be honest, though, that was his entire administration, really. That initiative was eventually run by scamvangelist preacher Paula White, who functioned as an all-in-one Trump hack, liaison for the prosperity gospel crowd, campaign promoter, and meme generator for critics. Just look her up on YouTube and you'll see what I mean. Here's where it gets really interesting, though. Melissa Rogers, of all people, actually argued that the nation was better off with Trump ignoring the Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships because it was clear Trump would have used it to advance a conservative Christian agenda. She wrote in a piece posted on Medium that we should not insist that Trump have such an office just to have it and that if the office is not set on a strong foundation, it can do more harm than good, and that it would be better not to have such an office than to have an office that is not committed to principles like these. She was referring to inclusion and church-state separation there. I don't think I need to tell you more about how Trump did everything he could to appease his conservative Christian base. So that brings us to the Biden administration and my original question. Is it good or bad that Biden is now bringing the office back? Well, considering that the office probably isn't disappearing anytime soon, 
because if it did, you can bet right-wing media outlets would have a field day with it, and considering that Democrats have a lot to gain strategically by publicly reaching out to religious communities and not letting Republicans claim the mantle of being the party for religious people, I'm actually extremely optimistic about its future, which is weird because I generally hate everything. The reason I feel that way is because Biden said the person steering the ship this time is none other than Melissa Rogers, the church-state separation advocate. She will oversee the office and serve as senior director for faith and public policy in the White House Domestic Policy Council. In the announcement of Rogers' appointment, just look at what Biden said, because it's been a long time since we've heard inclusive language like this. When Methodists and Muslims, Buddhists and Baptists, Sikhs and secular humanists serve together, we strengthen one another and we strengthen America. Fundamental to these goals is respecting our cherished guarantees of church-state separation and freedom for people of all faiths and none, as the executive order notes. The partnership's office, for example, will not prefer one faith over another or favor religious over secular organizations. Instead, it will work with every willing partner to promote the common good, including those who have differences with the administration. Hey, if you're gonna have a religious outreach office, that's the way it needs to be done. By the way, the office's deputy director will be Josh Dixon, who ran Faith Outreach for the Biden-Harris campaign. I'll tell you a quick personal story. Dixon was the person who helped us launch Humanists for Biden last fall. While a number of atheist activists did all the work, Dixon was present at some of our planning meetings and was our point of contact with the Biden campaign. There was no one in the Obama White House who did anything like that. Which is to say, there are people running this office now who know atheists, who understand the shared concerns of many of us, and who know how to get in touch with organizations that represent us. Americans United for Separation of Church and State, a group which would presumably condemn the office if it did not adhere to Establishment Clause principles, celebrated the appointment of Rogers, in large part because of what I just said. Rogers' mastery of church-state law and policy and her track record of finding shared values makes her exceedingly qualified for both positions. When she served in the Obama administration, Rogers successfully worked with people across faiths and the non-religious to adopt policies that protect the religious freedom of people who use federally funded social services. This new team has much work to do. The Trump administration spent four years adopting policies that misused religious freedom to sanction discrimination, deny access to health care, and require taxpayers to fund religion. We have confidence that the Biden administration will work hard to right these wrongs and reclaim religious freedom as a shield to protect rather than a sword to harm others we must ensure that our laws do not allow people to use their religious beliefs to harm others. Right on. I feel the same way. It's not all praise, though. Nick Fish, president of American Atheists, expressed concern about the bigger underlying issue of the office's existence, though even he praised the selection of Rogers. He makes a good point, however, so I want you to hear this. While I commend the Biden administration for reinforcing its commitment to religious pluralism and guarantees for church-state separation in this executive order, I am deeply concerned that the continued reliance on faith-based service providers has created a system where the American people are forced to endure coercive religious practices in order to access basic social services. Job number one needs to be strengthening and rebuilding protections for people seeking services from religious groups. No person should be turned away from a homeless shelter because they don't want to take part in prayer services. No prospective parents should face discrimination because of their sexual orientation, gender identity, or religious beliefs. 
and everyone must be made aware that they are entitled to a secular alternative to religious providers. The administration must also end the special privilege long provided to religious providers to discriminate in employment. I remain skeptical that it will be possible to fully protect the right of all Americans to be free from discrimination and coercive religious practices when accessing basic services given the current legal landscape. But the president's choices to lead this office are heartening. Melissa Rogers, Josh Dixon, and Trey Baker have demonstrated that they are thoughtful leaders who will engage with people of diverse religious traditions, including the more than one quarter of Americans who are non-religious. I hope they continue to do so in their roles in the White House. Fish is right to be concerned that social services provided by faith-based groups with taxpayer money could involve discriminatory practices. He's also making a great point that a better country wouldn't have to rely on religious groups to do things our nation ought to be providing already. Unfortunately, when your country is as broken as the United States, you got to take the help wherever you can get it, with some limitations. Rogers has been opposed to the things that worry Nick, and my hope is that her team will continue pushing back against any religious groups that want to practice bigotry with government assistance. If Christians want to provide a public service, good for them. If they want to use that taxpayer-funded service to win over new converts in any way, screw them. There will undoubtedly be criticism of the Biden administration for maintaining an office that arguably should not have to exist in the first place. But as long as it's around, it should at least be run properly. It looks like it now will be. The biggest watchdogs of government intrusion on the Establishment Clause are not worried about this office becoming a government tool to promote Christianity, which means you probably shouldn't worry about it either. But that doesn't mean we should let our guard down. In case you're curious, here's just a short list of the things I will be watching out for as this new team continues its work. Are they giving taxpayer money to religious groups doing good work, but which discriminate in hiring? They need to stop that. Will those religious groups force recipients of their generosity to pray or participate in some religious practice? Will they encourage it? That cannot happen. Those recipients need to be told they do not have to participate in those things. Will any of the grant money be used for proselytizing or other church functions? In other words, is this taxpayer money directly benefiting the people who need the help or padding the pocketbooks of church leaders beyond their costs to do the work? Will the religious groups getting money have to go through some kind of church-state separation training? They need to know the rules. History shows they often don't. And will non-religious voices finally have a seat at the table when we are discussing how the government interacts with people of faith and no faith? Joe Biden has not called me either. And he doesn't have to call me. But there are a lot of atheist activists and leaders out there who would be wonderful at providing a voice of reason in these discussions. And in 2021... It would be political malpractice for Democrats to pretend like secular Americans don't exist. So I'll give them a chance. But this office is one where it's so easy to screw up the basics and upset so many people. They cannot afford to do that. <laughs>